one day and it's getting closer, our cars will drive us on their own and today we're going to find out how far Xpong has already come with autonomous driving features, what to expect in the next couple of months and how this can change our lives in the next few years. With my guest, Xpong's Vice President of Autonomous Driving Center, Dr. Singja Wu. So let's get started right now. Welcome to Inside Xpong, the social media news series dedicated to everything that's going on with Xpong. As you can see, I am here at the brand new experience store right here in the Netherlands. So don't forget to follow us for more exciting news from Xpong. Well, it's no secret that we, the humans, are not very good at, uh, well, a lot of things, but especially driving the very cars that we make. But you know who's a better candidate? A computer on wheels. Even at these early stages of self-driving technology development, they are already better than us at having the eyes on the back of their heads with 360 camera coverage, seeing in the dark and through the rain with many different types of sensors, and not texting their girlfriends while driving. Just in case if you didn't know, Xpong rolled out the Navigation Guided Pilot, or NGP, over a year ago, allowing the drivers to let the cars take control on highways while navigating to a destination. For now, drivers are still required to watch the road and hold the steering wheel at all times. But this summer, Xpong will be rolling out the City NGP, which means the capable cars will be able to navigate on much more complicated urban roads. How was Xpong able to get this far ahead of most of the competition? What we can expect in the future and how do we teach cars how to drive? All good questions and the man who has the right answers is Xpong's Vice President of Autonomous Driving Center, Dr. Singja Wu. All right, Singja, the NGP was launched over a year ago and it is for highway use only. Now, when I was learning how to drive, I was told, you know, stick to the streets where the speeds are low and then venture out to highways. But it looks like you're teaching the computer how to drive the other way around. Why highways first? All right, the answer is quite simple. The street is actually not as benign as it looks. You know, the streets, especially in China, are quite complicated. There's a lot of electric bikes in China. The deliveries, they were sent to customers through using electric bike. And they are quite, I would say, difficult to handle on Chinese streets. Um, uh, in comparison, actually, highway uh, in China is uh, very similar to the rest of the world. You know, it's. Uh, very well structured road with uh, you know well defined kind of participants. It's actually quite I would say friendly even for autonomous driving. Now I'm going to assume your job is difficult to say the least. <laughs> a lot of challenges. What is the biggest challenge when you're trying to teach a computer, essentially a pile of metal and silicon, how to drive? Well, uh, the first level of uh, uh, challenge always comes from perception, essentially. Perception means how you see the world, how you understand the world, how you, you know, understand how others would move. So um, to how to train a, your uh, computer or machine to never make mistakes, I would say that is the biggest challenge. Um, and uh, then basically you have to understand the behavior of everybody around you. And as you know, we humans, we like to improvise. <laughs> we don't stick to the rules all the time. And how to make a computer, you know, work in a nicely way with that, without, uh, you know, making anything funny happen, it's also, I, I think, a big challenge. All right, now, how do you know when, when a computer makes a mistake? For example, when I'm driving and I make a mistake, my girlfriend definitely lets me know. How do you know when computer screws up? Well, computers are not like humans, you know, they're more consistent. <laughs> so they're not meant to make a mistake. You know, if they make a mistake, I didn't do my job well. Well, that said, uh, we do have uh, uh, multiple sensors, essentially, especially for the forward area, uh, have some level of redundancy to keep safety is very important. So we have plenty of redundancy in our sensor kind of suite to make sure nothing is being missed. And we also have the fallback mechanism. If you see something funny going on, let's say, well, the front, uh, the leader vehicle, right? Uh, speed jumped by, 
I would say 10 km per hour, which is not supposed to happen, then a warning will be sent to the driver to say, hey, look out, something is, uh, you know, not right. All right, now you mentioned the sensors, right? So let's talk about that because there are some auto manufacturers that uh, said we don't want to use LiDARs. As a matter of fact, I know at least the one that says forget about <laughs> the, the radars either, right? Just relying on cameras only, vision only. Now, you guys are using both LiDARs, radars in addition to the cameras. Tell me, why do you believe your way is better? All right. So actually, you know, I just touched upon that point in the previous question, right? Because redundancy is a very, very important to make sure safety is, uh, is, is maintained at a very high level. When you have uh, different sensors with different physical uh, characteristics to cover the same area, they can, uh, you know, kind of complete each other. Uh, like uh, radar, right? It, it's not a, you know, let's say, uh, for semantic uh, understanding of the world because it doesn't have a lot of pixels, it's, it's bad, but it does provide a very direct measurement of the speed because it's measuring frequency and Doppler. So that gives you a very accurate understanding of uh, that, uh, let's say, uh, 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 dimension of the world. And the same thing to the LiDAR. LiDAR doesn't provide the same amount of uh, pixels as compared to cameras as well, but LiDAR gives you a direct measurement of, of, of the 3D information depths, which is actually very, very useful, uh, especially in city driving. I, I guess we are gonna touch upon the city driving as well next. Um, because city driving is so difficult, I mentioned the different uh, road participants, some of them very small. You want to keep a uh, constant tracking of these uh, objects all the time. And also basically uh, there are um, um, random obstacles intruding into the road all the time. And you need to, um, you know, being able to detect these, uh, let's say, static obstacles as well and avoid them. And the LiDAR is the one that it gives you this uh, three dimension, basically, what is sometimes we call the drivable space all the time uh, without much effort. So it's also um, a measure of both redundancy uh, to keep safety and accuracy and accurate understanding of the world. Now, what happens when LiDAR, let's say, is saying one thing and the camera may see something different? Who wins that argument? Well, um, as I said, different sensors really have different physical characteristics. We have to trust the different sensors at, at their best. If, for example, if you want to tell the position of something, uh, you better trust LiDAR better. And the camera will give you a depth understanding as well. But uh, you, uh, you sometimes, uh, you know, using technical world, uh, word, we say that we boost their covariance, which means we trust them less. And for speed as well, uh, as I said, radar provide direct measurement of, of speed. In matter of speed, then you better trust uh, radar more. This is the basics of uh, how we call it the sensor fusion of how to use different sensors at their best. All right, well, that's very interesting. Okay, so now let's talk about, you know, you mentioned the uh, city and GP is coming pretty soon. Uh, and you mentioned it is very different than, than just highways. What is the biggest challenge there that you've seen so far? What is the biggest thing that you had to solve in order to make it work? Well, uh, road participants, as I mentioned, is, uh, is uh, I would say, the biggest challenge. In the city, basically, you have to constantly battle the, uh, you know, the pedestrians and uh, the electric bikes. Uh, you're in the States, right? Yes. Yeah, you probably don't see that. At least I don't see that in the States because the buses, they don't stick to the rules all the time. They do this 45 degree cutting all the time across multiple lanes. How do you deal with this kind of random behaviors and random road participants in the city road? Um, it, it's, 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 it's very, very challenging actually. So we have to use everything uh, we can uh, to make sure we have a constant understanding of the, uh, not only what, where they are, uh, the other road participants, but also their intention, and try to predict their next move so that we can make our move, um, you know, the safest way uh, possible, and also um, keep the comfort level acceptable, at least to our customers, which is super hard. Well, it's very interesting that you think that buses is the biggest road challenge in China, because here in America, it's the humans that's the biggest challenge. And yet uh, humans are still, you know, very much uh, don't, they, they don't trust the computers yet to, uh, you know, drive for them, even though, as I mentioned, they are not really that good at it themselves. What do you think has to happen for the uh, fallible humans to actually trust this technology? Well, um, 
I think the key thing is really to deliver a good enough technology to our customer hands so that they will start to use it. And uh, after that, hopefully they will never uh, stop using it. This is how it happened for Highway and GP. Uh, in the sense right now, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, what we call the mileage uh, penetration number, it's, a, uh, it's super high. Actually, uh, for every, uh, uh, let's say, 10 miles that can be driven um, with the highway NGP uh, in our customers, our customers in average are driving seven miles of them. It doesn't need the uh, driver to be so attentive anymore when uh, you are just uh, watching the machine doing its job. So this is really, really the key to uh, establish the foundation uh, be, um, of the trust between the technology and the people. Uh, essentially, you really need to deliver the technology at a high enough bar so that people feel, okay, this is something really, really useful. And that bar is super high. Um, and if you miss that bar, if you're making a few mistakes, let's say, I don't know, every 10 miles, then people will say, this is crap, I'm not going to use it. Speaking of trust, uh, one, one thing that people don't trust computers very often with, uh, and maybe rightfully so, is because they don't know where their data is going. And a lot of times it's, you know, they're very much concerned. Uh, what does Xpong do to, uh, uh, to pr pr preserve the customer data and make sure it's secure? All right, um, this is a great question. Actually, uh, uh, in China, the government has realized basically data security and privacy uh, in particular uh, is super important as well when we roll out the uh, autonomous driving technology. There's, um, there are multiple regulations ongoing right now uh, to make sure basic things are done in the proper way. For example, starting from uh, later this year, for all our data, you know, uh, collect from our vehicle, it will, uh, we're gonna do basically a blur the faces, all the faces, uh, you know, we see. So, the, so from the image, you cannot tell. For all the data we put in our system, we, we will put uh, you know, the highest security level you can imagine so that people don't get to abuse it. And also, basically, we will, in terms of keeping privacy, uh, we will try to basically make all the data anonymous uh, so that they can be used to help our technology but not uh, harm any privacy uh, you know, of our customers. Let's talk about the fact that you know, Axpong has been one of the very few uh, passenger vehicle manufacturers that has such advanced uh, self-driving features. Um, so wh what's the secret sauce? Why were you guys able to get this far ahead of most of the competition? Now, I know you want to hear the answer to this question as well. However, I'm going to have to interrupt right here because we did not expect our conversation to go this long as we had a lot of fascinating topics to cover. So we're going to air the second part of this interview next week. And that's only more reason to follow us right here. So you will be the first one to know when that part comes out. For now, my name is Alex Guberman reporting from Xbox's very first experience store right here in Netherlands. See you next time. And Remember to stay charged.